Hello and welcome back to Breaking the Consensus here on Protect Life. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Seth Tillman, who's a lecturer in law uh, in Maynooth, used to be St. Patrick's College Maynooth. And we're going to be talking about a little bit about the elections, about the legacy of President Trump, the electoral system over there, and the other elections that maybe aren't getting anything like the coverage that they had. But first of all, uh, Seth, would you like to tell us a little bit how Seth Tillman ends up in Maynooth? I, I wish people wouldn't say ends up. That's, that <laughs> always makes it sound like it's problematic. So Get the first thing, let me, let me correct you just a bit. St. Patrick's College Maynooth is still there. True, uh, that is true. Man Maynooth University shares part of the campus with them. And, and uh, uh, we share some facilities and we also have our own independent facilities. And sometimes we even share students and students transfer between our two programs. I, I came to Ireland because I was offered work here for which I applied and was glad to get it. <laughs> uh, I, came, uh, I came in 2011, which was just as the country here was working itself out of the last recession. And many of my students in those days would come up to me and would say something along the lines, how long are you going to be here for? As if I was here temporarily. Uh, they were unused to the idea of someone immigrating to Ireland, at least <laughs> the kids in that age cohort. Yeah. And I always give them the same answer. And I still give people the same answer. I am here as long as they pay me. I have to, I have to support myself and I have to support my family and I have work here and I'm glad to have it. I'm very glad to have it. So, well, that's, uh, that's you're, you're, so uh, if, as far as my bio, uh, I went to school in the United States. I have a college degree from the University of Chicago in economics. Uh, after that, I had a first career as a futures and futures options trader. I went back to school. I have a law degree from Harvard Law School. I practiced law in um, Washington, D.C. and in Delaware, and I was a law clerk, sort of an assistant to several judges in the United States. I always had my eye on academia. I published while I was a law clerk and practitioner, and then I came here, and that's, that's my story. Excellent. So elections in the United States feel like they last so much longer than here. It's true. And after what, it, uh, it feels like around two years of an election. <laughs> I think we can say that Joe Biden is going to be, or going to be the next president of the United States. I, I, think, I think unless you were given very good odds, I, I take that bet too at this point. Just very, very briefly, um, there have been a series of legal challenges in different states uh, around Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, I know, is they're still going on. Do you think there was ever any serious intent in this, or was this performative? Oh, I think there were elements of both. Uh, I think the uh, people who brought the case thought they had, and still think they have, some uh, reasonable evidence, and they're hoping more mat will materialize as the legal challenges go on. Uh, it, it was a very unusual election in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, Trump was massively ahead in several states before they stopped counting the votes. And uh, then when they reopened the ballots uh, the next morning, all of a sudden uh, those leads uh, precipitously disappeared quite quickly in um, uh, ratios of votes in the remaining ballots that were quite unlike what had been counted on election day. Now, that doesn't mean there was any cheating, but it is sort of unusual and it raises some eyebrows. If I think one thing that is slightly odd for people here is that even though it's a federal election, I think, is it right, am I correct in saying that each state will make its own rules about how the election is conducted within the state? Not only will each state do it, but uh, state authorities will often delegate a great deal of authority to counties within the states. And the counties will also have a certain amount of discretion with uh, regard to interpreting election rules. So yes, every, every state will have its own uh, election statutes and sometimes every county will have its own election regulations. That's exactly right. Uh, by the way, that's not so different from uh, elections for the European Union, where every country has its own election regulations. That's in, true. In the member state itself. As a matter of fact, uh, though you read in the Irish press uh, 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 and, and commentary at uh, all these comments about how strange American elections are, they're really not all that different from what you have here. Uh, so, for example, you, you'll see people look at the American system of scans and they'll say, isn't it terrible? that the president can be elected without a clear majority of the vote. That's really no different from how elections are held in Britain, where from time to time, the prime minister's party in Britain might have more seats, but actually fewer votes on election day. True. The, the same is actually true here in Ireland. It's just harder to tell because proportional vo voting and the automatic transferable vote make it more difficult to sense 
how many votes went to the members in the governing coalition and how many votes went to the members outside the governing coalition. So let me give you an example. Uh, it's not uncommon in a multi-member constituency, like a constituency with five members, that the first four members come in at quota or above. Mm -hmm. You'll agree with me. Yeah. It's not uncommon that the last person in the constituency comes in under quota. Sure. So what you may have is a, is a doll with let's say 60 out of uh, 160 members where people came in under quota. In the last election, 65 out of 160 members came in under quota. Now, how many of those members are in the government and how many of those members are outside the government? My latest count was about 40 of the 65 are in the governing coalition. So it's not impossible for the governing coalition to have fewer votes, even if it has a majority of seats, than the members outside of the government. There's absolutely, in fact, I'll go, I'll go a little further. If you track uh, first preference voting, mm -hmm. the kind of vote that Fianna Fáil were getting in the 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, but failed to get an overall majority, mm -hmm. if they got that vote today, they would actually get an overall majority. I, I, you, I, I understand If you got, that. If you got 40... 45% of the vote today, first mm -hmm. preference vote, you would have an overall majority, even though 55% of the population had not voted for you. I, I think that's probably right. Just, there, we hadn't talked about, but there, I just would like your impression on this. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by uh, what we could, you could call foreign, foreign, foreign press reporting in the sense of, I lived in Italy for many years and I was always fascinated reading reports about Italy written out written uh, by English papers or Irish papers because very often I would be reading an account of something happening in Italy I think this is not this country this is I don't know what country this man is writing about that's right it must be in a country where I don't know if it's since Kennedy the rule is pretty simple in American politics Democrat good Republican bad I I, I think there is there is a sense that the press is overwhelmingly Democrat in the United States. But I, I don't know that we should get beat up about that, to tell you the truth. Uh, what Ronald Reagan showed and what the first Trump election showed is that although the press is an important player, uh, they're not determinative. Uh, people can be elected with an R on their name in spite of the press. And that doesn't mean, and that doesn't mean they have to give up their principles either. Sure, oh. but when you're reading a report in the Irish, uh, the Irish, uh, the Irish media about the United States, do you sometimes feel like you're reading about a country that you don't recognise? Not much. It's not wor much worse here in the Irish media than the American media. <laughs> 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 and 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 I do recognise it because that's just the way it is. I mean, I I don't get beat up about this in part because in a free society, people ought to be allowed to think and say and write what they like, and if it works out, the the, the majority of the media doesn't agree with me, you know, those are just lumps I'm gonna to have to take. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna whine about that, that a lot of people disagree with me. It's true, they do. And also whining is, it, it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not a great political strategy anyway. It's not, it's not a great political strategy. And you know what? Lots of Republicans get elected in spite of it. And that's one of the things we saw in this election. Now, we were talking there about majority votes and like as it happened for you mentioned for example it did happen in the 70s in England the Tories won the popular vote but the Labour Party actually won more seats in Parliament and formed the government. And I think there was a case in the 50s when it was the other way around when the Tories scratched out a narrow victory in terms of seats but actually had fewer popular yeah. votes. I mean in any system where the head of government or the head of state is elected indirectly through another election, like the Electoral College in the United States or the alternative transfer vote here or first past the post in Britain, there is always the risk that the person who wins the most of those intermediate seats has actually fewer votes. And the head of government, uh, as a result, might not have the customary or expected popular mandate. So, I mean, I have to admit, one of the things I find frustrating about both the American media and the Irish media is they, 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 they look askance at the American Electoral College but really, it's exactly the same system here. It's just so much better hidden. That's all it is. You use the word college. I think that's very interesting. I wanted to uh, talk about the, the electoral college itself uh, as, as an idea. Well, I, that, that, it's, it's, not a college, it's not a college in the sense of the, I think, what is called the, 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 uh, the Vatican when the College of the Cardinals meet. No, that's, they that's, all, they that's, all what meet together, I, I believe. 
that's what that's what I discovered as if he was telling me the truth from Richard Epstein, the great Chicago scholar, that actually it was originally modeled by the framers of the Constitution on the car the College of Cardinals. Uh, I think it's a little bit of a stretch. I think I think the it, well, he's he, he's always entertaining, if nothing he's else. Always under, he, look, he's a bright guy. I'm not saying he's wrong, uh, uh, but I'm not sure he's right either. I think I think the, the the framers of the U.S. Constitution, when they came upon the Electoral College, it was largely ad hoc and by accident when they couldn't get other systems to work. And what they needed quickly to do was to get some sort of working agreement so they could get the constitution, the new national government up and running. The, what is there the, wasn't a lot of thinking going into the structure of the electoral college. So uh, as much there, as the other things had to be ruled out. If there is a, a but let me just finish, an underlying principle let me, behind let me just, it. Let me just finish the thought I was making before. Uh, when the, the electors meet the electors are elected in each separate state and each state will have a day when its electors who have been certified by the election process there will ballot for their presidential candidate and those ballots will be mailed to the U.S. Congress and when the new Congress opens they open the ballot so so there's no one room where all the electors from across the nation meet the electors meet separately in their separate states and that's the electoral college. I've heard that the justification for the electoral college is that it's a balancing affair so that you get a mix you don't get the large cities, the large states dominating politics. Uh, is there anything to that? that was, that's an after the fact justification. That, that isn't how it came about. Uh, now that, that, that might be a reason to maintain it going forward. As a matter of fact, I think there are lots of good reasons to maintain it going forward. The, what are they? For, so, the Democrats but, are complaining but, but today about- Before we go to those reasons, we, we should point out that it, the issue is the same in Britain and the same in Ireland. That is, the British don't get beat up by the fact that on occasion, uh, a governing majority doesn't have a majority of the popular vote behind it. That's just the way the system plays out. Sure. And, in, and in Ireland, nobody even bothers to count the popular vote to see <laughs> how many votes the government, I mean, that's the amazing thing in this country. Half the media copying the American media will point fingers at the US and say, isn't it terrible that not only can a president not only have a majority vote, he might not even be the plurality winner. But certainly that was the case here with the last Fine Gael government when it had confidence in supply, that is the governing coalition, even with confidence in supply, still might not have a majority. No, no one here gets beat up. The point is, if the people of the country know the rules, like their rules, yes. I don't think it's undemocratic if their rules are a little different. Ireland's rules are, as far as I could tell, if not absolutely unique worldwide, almost unique. I think Malta has some uh, a similarly structured parliament. Yeah. But, but is Ireland's rules where you must have at least three members per constituency might very well be unique around the world. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I, I'm not suggesting you should abandon but, it. But if everybody playing the game knows the rules of the game. Exactly, exactly. And, and the same is true in Britain. If everyone knows the rules of the game and everyone is, is in basic agreement with the rules, there's no reason because of democracy to abandon those rules in favor of one national election. Now, there is a country that does have one national election where you have parties in proportion to the vote. Uh, one such nation is Israel. Uh, it's not peaches and cream there. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not, they have their own electoral problems. Yeah. Uh, now, all, I, I'm not going to, I mean, I could launch a partial defense of the electoral college to say why there are good reasons to keep it. But to me, the basic point is that it's not so different from Britain. It's not so sure. different from Ireland. And if the people of the United States basically like it, then they ought to be allowed to keep it without people saying, oh my God, it's undemocratic. It's not undemocratic. It's just slightly different. So say, but say the Democrats decide, okay, we're, we're, we're going for this because you know what? The way the demography is organized now, we're in a position, we're going to continue winning the popular vote. So we want to get rid of the electoral college. First of all, what were the process what would that process involve? And is there any likelihood they could see, succeed? Well, uh, there are two possible processes. One is to amend the constitution to do away with the electoral college. And that would be virtually impossible because it takes consent of three quarters of the states. And right now, a majority of the state legislatures are in Republican hands. So that process is just not a, a non-starter. There's another possibility that they could do it by statutory means. And that would be reviewed by the courts and I'm not sure the courts would look friendly at it, to tell you the truth. Uh, but the truth is, I don't even think the Democrats are seriously going to try. Right now, there's a new administration, in all likelihood, and they don't get any plaudits from changing procedures. As a matter of fact, 
when, when, a new, when a new administration or new party comes in, the people who elected them want concrete changes in their life and tend not to look at procedural change sure. as something for them. They see it for the insiders. And the party might be rewarded in the broad sense. It might help them at election time, but it may backfire big. As a matter of fact, one of the things I said in 2016 on my blog, and it was picked up by a few people, though a lot of Republicans disagreed, was I said the new administration shouldn't put too much of an investment into Supreme Court seats and into the judiciary. The rank and file don't see that as their life. They want substantive change policy coming out of Washington. They want people in the executive branch changing the way we live. That's what I said. Do you uh, think now, the court issue was a bit of inside base, inside baseball. No, no. I, I, I think one reason Trump went with it was he had cooperation fr from McConnell, and he had more cooperation from McConnell on that than he did on lots of policy questions. Sure. So he wanted to achieve within a venue that he could get cooperation from other Republicans. And, I, and don't don't misunderstand me. A lot of Republicans value putting Republicans and people sympathetic to uh, uh, their constitutional view on the courts. I'm not saying it's not important, but if the first thing a new administration does, this happens all the time, by the way, in state legislatures, uh, uh, the, the, there's a change in control in the state legislature. And the first thing the legislature does is it re-gerrymanders the map in its favor for the next yeah. election. All right now that might be legal, but it doesn't win you any friends with the people who elected you who didn't put you there to make your seat safer. They put you there to do something for their life. Yeah. And, and, and I also think that the Democrats did not run on a clear uh, uh, manifesto or uh, uh, party statement of abandoning the Electoral College. So to do that, I don't think comes with the best bona fides. I don't imagine there'll be a big move to abandon the Electoral College. To tell you the truth. If we're to look at Trump's legacy, he's a single term president. Um, We'll get in the court in a second, but let's say that the story is being written not today or tomorrow, but 20 years down the line. You're talking about making it not, not a genuine different, difference to people's lives. If you were to look at the economic outcomes, wage, wages, wage increases, employment, etc., in comparison, say, to the first... To, to, to I, Obama, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I think that's going to be hard to do. I think, I think the reason it's going to be hard to do is, although he had a very strong first three years plus, Corona so overcame the economy of the United States, as it did the rest of the world because of the lockdown, mm -hmm. that any positive change in the economy, and I think there were many that should go to Trump's credit from deregulation and from other changes in policy, are just going to be overshadowed. So I think when Trump's legacy gets ridden, it's not going to be focused on economics, to tell you the truth. I think, I think it could, it's, it's much simpler than that. I would say Trump is the greatest peacetime president of my life. Simple really? as that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, there's been no war. Now, True. for an American, I mean, for an American, when I say peacetime president, I mean, he kept the peace. That is, that is Trump re is reaching back, or I thought was reaching back, to an older view of American society, going back to Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover, which is that America's business is business, we want to help people in other parts of the world, but we're not going to defend you. Uh, and there were no major land wars in Asia or no major American wars during Trump's administration. And that, that is Trump's legacy. That is, many people in Washington and around the United States believe that the United States' special role or exceptional job is to be policemen of the world, and Trump said no. And and one, of the reason, one of the reasons he had so much difficulty in Washington was he was trying to unwind many of the wars the United States was involved in at the time he took over and are still involved in places like Afghanistan. And there was tremendous pushback from the security apparatus and from the military who didn't take warmly to being told to unwind their wars. I, I, I know that might surprise you. It might make me sound like a far left winger. But that used to be what American conservatism stood for. No, no, I understand. But there's, a, but isn't it true that the, that has, the, in a sense, been the tension in the Republican Party since, for, well, since Nixon? And the, I saw an article in the National Review suggesting that actually it's resonating at the point you're making that if that one of the things that most important things that Trump may have done is to take the party away from that neocon direction, the interventionist. I, I, think, I, I think I think neocon clouds the issue. It's Washington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is the Bidens and the Clintons and the Bushes.
both sides of the political spectrum, and Trump was on the outside of that. Uh, and, and I think probably if you saw a breakdown of the vote, what you'd see is that the rank and file in the American military, people below lieutenant, people who would be on the front line, voted for Trump massively, and people right. who were full bird curdle it up were closer to 50-50 or favored the Democrats. That's, that's very interesting. I, I, you said before it's pointless to whine about the media, and you're quite right. But I still can't. I, I, I still was surprised. We'll put it mildly that what seems to have been one of the most important moves towards a peace agreement in the Middle East, with the recognition of the state of Israel by people like the Arab. The but there's Arab. no secret. There. Look, the American people know what happened. They know about those three treaties: two with an Arab nation and one in Kosovo. It, it's not hidden. It made the papers. The American people heard it. It's true he didn't get any credit from the media, but he got credit and election day for that. But the truth is the American people aren't going to give you a lot of credit for that. Kosovo, most Americans can't find it on a map. All right. As a fact, and, and not just Americans. And, and the fact of the matter is what's, what's more important to the average American is not that Trump brokered peace in the, in the Middle East and the surrounding environment, but that Trump kept the American military out of war. Now, that, people knew that when they voted, all right? Yeah. It's true he didn't get any plaudits from the media, but I don't think that matters all that much. Uh, okay. If we I, I, I want to suggest an alternative. That is, let, let, let me point out one thing that, you know, let's be clear here. Trump wasn't a perfect candidate either. And, and I think there were a lot, of, a lot of people who were otherwise friendly to Trump who felt he didn't do enough um, to help average people during these lockdowns get back to normal life. Uh, many of us are unhappy with the extent of these lockdowns. And uh, Trump would always talk that the lockdowns are too much, but he wasn't out there vigorously using the power of the federal government to stop them either. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably cost him some votes. If he had set up this election as he was the candidate coming to end the lockdowns and the Democrats want to keep you in his home, in your home, it might have been very different. If we just look at the, the, the court for a moment, he's in, in a single term, he succeeded in appointing three justices, all three of whom would be perceived or seen to be pretty solidly, oh, we call them conservative, we call them republic, and you can call them originalists, whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's, first of all, do you find it concerning the, the fact that now people talk about Democrat judges and Republican judges? No, they always have. There's nothing That's new about that. It, 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 it's been this way forever. <laughs> this is nothing new. Let, 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 me, let me tell you something. Uh, I, I have a former student from, uh, from my law program, very bright kid, uh, who uh, for whatever reason decided to leave Ireland, went to the United States and became a lawyer there and has prospered well there. And one of the things he says, he said, he said, Seth, one of the things I love about this country, referring to the United States, is that everybody knows who's on the Supreme Court and we all get to talk about it and it's so interesting. And what I said to him is, that's a sign of the tremendous failure of the United States. It shouldn't matter who's on the court. Mm. That is, if, 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 your, if your country doesn't know the name of your chief justice, it's probably a good thing. Because it means the important decisions are being made at the ballot box or in the legislature. Yes. Right? So, so the fact that it's so important for each of the two parties to get their people on the court, that's one of the failures of American society, not one of its successes. Now, given that this failure is there, let's be honest, most of us would like to see someone sympathetic to our own idea and ideals there. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't confuse the fact that one is winning a struggle with the struggle being a good thing. Yeah. All right. It would be better if the sensitive questions of life were determined at the ballot box, not through unelected judges who are there forever. And it's another failure of American society that there's no there's no real retirement age that these judges get to pick the own, the time when they leave, and sometimes they leave in very bad health and aren't well the last few months or years when they're on the bench. Uh, I, take, I take your point. I think it, not necessarily that I liked the result, but for example, we had a, we had a, a we had a popular vote here on the issue of gay marriage, mm -hmm. and all across the world, what we saw where marriage was introduced 
it was introduced via the courts. And I, I always felt that was the wrong way that, that for something like that to happen. And here, whether you like the result or not, it was done by will of the people. And that's the I, way it was done. I, I, I 100% percent agree with you on that. And it, it, and, and again, I'm not one for bad mouthing America, but this is one that Ireland has on America. You did it the right way here if you're going to do that at all. So con allowing that uh, they are important as they are, as we say they are, is are the appointments of these three judges young, uh, young, healthy, we, we assume, we hope, God, God willing, uh, is, this is going to be a significant part if there is a Trump legacy that their presence on the court is going to be that. I, I think there are lots of people who are hoping for that, but I, I think your hopes are likely to be dashed. I mean, the, 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 way, it, the way it generally works is that uh, there'll be a median justice or two with justice in the middle, who as push comes to shove, as there are people pushing from one side, he'll start swooping towards the other. And we're seeing this already with John Roberts. I mean, this is, this is the way it was with Kennedy for his whole life, former yeah. Justice Kennedy. And now we're seeing it from Roberts. But, uh, and, it would, and, and you know what? My guess is if we had another president who appointed three people to the right of Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Cody Barrett, we'd see those three do the same thing because it's, it's, it's almost the natural order of things up there, the way things tend to work. People say that what Roberts is doing in a sense is as the chief, he feels that it's important for him to maintain the, the status of the respect to, of the institution and for him therefore he feels he has to be this balance point this negotiation. I, I can't possibly read John Roberts's mind. You have no window into see. I, have, I, have, I, I can and then again I, I can't I, I couldn't read Kennedy either. Uh. <laughs> what I mean is if, if that worries about do you have any sympathy for the idea that there has to, that in this situation that you have to try and at least I, I have I have no sympathy that that's an appropriate philosophy of judging because it's unfair to the parties. Mm -hmm. you're, what, what you're saying is, as I see it, because what you're saying is the judge should be holding his finger to the air, looking for balance, irrespective of what the document he's interpreting actually says. He sh I mean, I think he should be figuring out what the document means. Now, I'm not I'm not the there. That is not the only philosophy of judicial craftsmanship. But it, it strikes me as a very odd way to judge that whether you go one way or another on an issue depends upon how the other people in the court are voting. That your your independence is gone at that point. I think, if nothing else, for law to be just, it must be to, must be predictable. Well, yeah, uh, but I mean, that's I don't know that, that that's all that helpful either, because many originalists think that past precedents were wrong, and the law would lose at least a certain element of consistency in the short run if a lot of past precedents were put aside because they were judged wrongly. Okay, talking about past precedents, the great one that are, I know that a lot of people listening to this are going to be particularly interested in and the role of stare decisis is the, the decision of Roe. I know we've heard lots of commentary from justices on, shall we say, on the left and the right that the Roe decision was a poor decision in law. But do you think that the, real, that the reality is at this stage that people who think that you're going to see Roe overturned by Republican uh, Republican appointments to the Supreme Court are basically it's 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 delusional. This is just um, Roe is the law. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's delusional. I think it's it's possible. I I mean, if if you put if you wanted to count judges, you could say, well, let's look at Trump's three new people. He's got Amy Coney Barrett, he's got Gorsuch, and he's got Kavanaugh. All right. Let's assume. All right. Just for the purpose of the conversation that those three were 100% reliable, so to speak, to overturn Roe. Okay, let's assume, all right? Uh, in theory, I suppose, Alito and uh, Thomas are even 200% reliable. <laughs> those guys, those guys have been waiting a lifetime to see Roe gutted, all right? <laughs> all right, but the funny thing is, every time a president gets another such person on the court, it never seems to emerge for whatever yeah. reason. I mean, one of the things I wrote some years ago is that when um, President Trump had an opportunity, he should have offered Thomas or even Alito the attorney general spot and gotten them off the court because they're old, <laughs> right? I mean, this is what happened to Ginsburg. Why didn't Ginsburg retire? 
when Obama was there, right? Well, there are two reasons. One, she assumed, as most of the world assumed, that Clinton was going to win, and she wanted to give the spot to Clinton. Mm -hmm. But that's not the real reason. That's, that, that's the reason people tell themselves when they don't know the real reason. The real reason is it's a great job being the judge, and people hate giving it up. And the people who know the judge don't want to be the person to put their arm around their shoulder and said, it's time to go. Because one, they're not going to go. Yeah. And two, then you've alienated them. They're there for the rest of their lives. And, 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 and what Trump should have done is he should have brought Thomas in and said, this is what I would have done if I was, I've been Trump. Yeah. I would have said, Justice Thomas, these people tortured you for 30 years. Don't let them get the last slot. Be my attorney general and we'll appoint someone younger for the slot. Now, maybe those five votes are reliable that we just named to overturn Roe. Maybe. I'm not sure they are, to tell you the truth. I mean, you might not know it, but Gorsuch and Kavanaugh often vote just opposite from one another. So I don't know that they're going to be reliable on Roe versus Wade. But they're, they're both over 70 now, I believe. Uh, I don't know they're going to have an opportunity the next ter term. People, I hate to say this, I, I'm not happy about it. People die all the time. Uh, uh, and then that seat will go to the new administration and there won't be five votes there because you certainly can't depend on Chief Justice Roberts to overturn Roe. But can we, all, can we say that whatever's happening at the federal level and Roe establishing the right, that at the state level, we're seeing state legislatures effectively rolling back the extent to which the, 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 the federal right is, is, can be exercised in the states? You're seeing some states. Some states, yeah. But, but it's not what the United States is supposed but to. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, look, at, think of the X case here in Ireland, right? Mm. As long as there's a right to travel, it doesn't really matter whether abortion is illegal in Ireland. The person just takes a ticket to Ulster or to England, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if, if Ireland banned abortion tomorrow, would abortion cease among Irish people? No. no, but people would argue that the, the rate of abortion would decline. It, it probably would at the, I, look, I agree with you. And, and, and that's why one could sympathetically look at the German solution to the abortion question. I'm not saying it's right, but one can be sympathetic to it, which is that on the books it's illegal, but no one's ever prosecuted for it. Right. Right. That is the, the education function, the teaching function is a, a societal judgment that at, at the margin, at least it's negative, but there's an allowance that it either it will happen or that in some cases it's right to happen. And therefore we're not gonna inspect individual cases and not punish people for it. So, I, I, I mean, I agree with you that there are some states like Alabama and Mississippi and not just in the deep South, but in other parts of the country where uh, the state legislatures and governors are working cooperation to limit abortion uh, in, in those states. But to tell you the truth, I don't know how effective that is as a long-term strategy. Uh, uh, the real... It's at the federal I level, that's the real, where the real decision will, the ultimate. I, I, I wasn't so much gonna, going to say that. Uh, if there's no national consensus, there's no national consensus. And there isn't, and there's no sign that there's going to be. And also, right. people would argue that, I've heard people, conservatives argue that the, the point of the United States in a sense was that the law as it before Roe, where New York, it, abortion was legal in New York. And that was the decision of the people of the state of New York. And if it wanted, if, and if this, the people of the state of North Dakota wanted it be, to be illegal, then that would reflect the, the morals and the values of the people of the state of North Dakota. That was certainly the, largely the status quo before Roe versus Wade. Perhaps with a limited constitutional exception to save the life of the mother in an emergency situation, perhaps. I mean, I mean even that's arguable, but yes. I mean, the, the United States was a federal system and still is to a large extent, in much the same way that the European Union is. And the European courts frequently will talk about the margin of appreciation for these very contested value judgments dealing with the termination of life. And not just with abortion, but with uh, other uh, end of life oh. termination decisions. I, I have heard people say that actually, legally or judicially, uh, Trump's big success, if we want to use that language, hasn't re ha isn't so much in the Supreme Court, but at the federal level, um, if that's the other judges, if that's the other judges. The of federal judges, is, is that true, and why is it true? Right. I mean, he 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 filled more vacancies at the trial court and circuit court level than most other presidents in a four-year period. Uh, there 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 were have been other presidents who filled vacancies at about the rate Trump did. Uh, 
but I think Trump quite clearly surpassed the last three presidents. So again, that's an important thing. But again, I, if, if the only thing you could point to in administration is he got judges on the bench for lifetime appointments, that, that to me was a real problem. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad those judges are there. And it, in some ways as a, as a lawyer, what I'm saying might surprise you, but as a human being and citizen, I look very much askance at an administration who says as its first thing out of the bat, we got the judges on the bench. Yeah. That, that, that isn't what they were elected to do. And that isn't what Trump said four years ago either. Now, again, I'm not saying it wasn't an achievement and I'm not saying he shouldn't have tried to do this, sure. but the, the willingness to focus on this, that's a little bit problematic. Okay. Yeah. Well, Trump, Trump was not as successful, by the way, getting executive appointments into his cabinet confirmed by the Senate. And I think part of the reason for that was he had more cooperation from McConnell and the Senate Republicans with regard to judges. Uh, uh, and they, they probably saw Trump in 2016 as a one-termer. And they thought it was probably more valuable to get judges on the bench for the long term than just to help Trump build his cabinet. Of course, that works both ways. By not helping Trump build his cabinet, probably cost him votes on election days. And now the next set of judges, they're going to be Biden's. Sure. So if we can go, before we finish up, back to the, the, the American system has elections all the way down in a way that we don't. Sheriffs are elected, judges are elected, school boards, school districts. I mean, there's a level of popular democracy, which is fantastic. But you know, in Switzerland, that's the kind of thing maybe they have. But we perhaps we have we lost with the, the abolition of parish councils and things here. The, Ameri the Democrats won the presidency, but there was a there was a real sense of, in the media of a sense of disappointment at everything else. Could you just have a, a just a, a yeah? I, I think a word I on think the both, down ticket. I think both parties got pummeled pretty hard, to tell you the truth. If, but, you know, I, I have a some friends uh, in Chicago, and I, I I told a joke about them. That is, uh, there were a couple where where uh, both parties married up. Uh, <laughs> You know, or 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 the or the alternative is a couple where both parties married down. Uh, uh, both parties got pummeled on election night, mm -hmm. in, in very real way. So let me give you an example. Let's, let's start with the U.S. Senate. Uh, the Republicans came into the election uh, with 53 seats. All right. Uh, the Democrats. I'm sorry. Yeah, 53 seats. Uh, uh, right now, uh, the, the Republicans have 50. Uh, uh, They've lost one seat to the Democrats, one Senate seat, and two seats are yet to be determined. If the Republicans lose the, the two remaining seats and only have 50 of the 100 seats, effectively that gives the Democrats control because the vice president, the new vice president, will have a vote on division. So a loss of three seats would be a big loss for the Republicans if that's how it emerges. On the other hand, if they win one of the remaining two seats and keep control, then or win both, then it means they only lost one or two seats that's a loss, but a win's a win. If you keep control, that's a win. Yeah. Right? So losing two, one or two seats is a loss, but if you keep control, that's a win. If they lose three seats, then it is a loss. Now it works the same way for the Democrats in the House. The Democrats came into this election with 235 seats and control of the House. It looks like now they're gonna be down to 222 or 223 seats. You need 218 for control. Right. They now have the narrowest majority of any majority in at least 20 years, if not in 100 years. So they've lost 13 seats, but they still have control. So the Republicans are excited. Look, we gained 13 seats, but they still don't have control. So the Democrats got pummeled. They expected to increase their majority. They lost part of their majority, but they still have control. So in a way, both parties lost. At the state level, there were nine governorships that were up for election. The party structure of those governorships, Democrat seats remain Democrats, Republican seats remain Republican, except for one that flipped one governorship flipped from Democrat to Republican, that was Montana. And that's significant because the Montana legislature was already Republican, so that means control of the state is now in Republican hands. In the state legislatures, the split of state legislative houses was about 29 states Republican, 19 states Democrat. No states flipped except New Hampshire. New Hampshire, both, both legislative houses in the bicameral chamber went from Democrat to Republican, which is significant because the Republicans already have the governorship, so the Republicans got the state. Mm -hmm. but the Republicans also picked up an excess of 150 state legislative seats nationally. Uh, 
So down ticket, the Republicans gained two states and they gained about 150 seats, which is kind of unusual when you lose the presidency. When you lose the, usually when you lose the presidency, you lose down market. The Republicans actually clawed out small victories across the country. One governorship, two state houses, two state control, and about 150 legislative. That's pretty good. Matter of fact, that's great for a night that you lost the, the presidency. That hasn't happened since, as a, a, a friend pointed out, pointed out since 1960, since Kennedy Nixon. And many people think there was cheating in that election. <laughs> Are you from Chicago? Uh, I lived in Chicago for many years. I went to the University of Chicago and I had my first career there, and so there for over a dozen years. I ask because of course, famously, Chicago was suspected to be the seat of much of the cheating. Not just Chicago, but also Texas. Yeah. Uh, but, but certainly, Chicago. I mean, uh, the truth is, uh, only one or two people were sent to jail for the cheating in, in Illinois that year. And I don't think they were from Chicago. I think they were from what we call downstate, from one of the uh, southern counties of Illinois. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it was- Illinois has a rich tradition. Well, you know- Recently, I, in the last century, people, people, that, people say yeah. that, people say that, but it, it's not always so clear. I'll, I'll tell you a story about Chicago voting. Um, uh, there are these housing projects in Chicago that are overwhelmingly minority. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it, the Democratic Party have what are called ward committee men who make sure that the vote is turned out. There's a story about a very successful minority ward committee man who got 200 votes in his 220 vote constituency, all to turn out for the Democrats. And the story is his ward committee man said, what are you crazy? You couldn't get two Republicans to turn out. We're gonna have the federal authorities monitoring us forever. <laughs> he was encouraging him to cheat the other way. You understand? So, I mean, uh, so the Democratic Party in Chicago for most of my life has been so successful, it didn't have to cheat. <laughs> you understand? I mean, for example, I lived in a particular ward where the, the rental board's policy was structured to bring in non-voting immigrants because the, the Democratic Party in the ward had a lock on the voters who were there they didn't want new voters, new citizen voters moving into the district. So they, they controlled the regulatory authorities to make the ward particularly attractive to non-voter, non-citizens. Now, now you might, is that cheating? Well, it's not cheating in the sense they're stealing votes. Creative. It, it, it's certainly unusual. So, so uh, not everything that looks dishonest is illegal. And not everything that appears to be cheating always is. I'll, I'll give you one other a good election story. Every, every uh, election cycle in America, you'll, you'll read a story like this in the American papers and people will say, oh, isn't that cute? Of a husband and wife running against one another for some minor office. And everyone says, isn't that cute? But there's a reason that happens. There are large sections in the United States where there's effectively only one party, mm -hmm. where everyone knows that the Democrat will win or the Republican will win. The other party is just totally moribund but there still is a formal structure for the other party. And sometimes that party doesn't even bother with the primary because they can't even get anyone to run for the office. But, what, 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 but in order to generate competition, there's usually a regulation that says the party official structure could parachute a person in on the ballot who could appear on the general election ballot without a primary if there was no one on the primary ballot. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah. To head that off, a married couple will have the other spouse <laughs> run in the primary of the other party so that the other party can't even parachute someone in. Do you understand? Yes. Now, is, that, is that cheating? No, no, no it's, it's not. It's the and rules this, of the game, the rules of the rules. The rules. This is my favorite one, and you see this all the time. You'll see a very contested election. It's usually at the primary level, not at the general election, right? Well, there'll be, for example, because of uh, remapping or re gerrymandering two um, uh, incumbents are forced to run against one another. And it's gonna be tight, you understand? Yeah. What will happen is one of the contestants will say, let's find someone to put on the ballot who has a name, just like my opponent, and they'll split the vote. And since it's first past the post, if I just peel a few votes off from him by having a very similar name, I could win, I could slip through. Happens all the time. Is that cheating? Well, yes, sort of, it's immoral, but it's not against the rules and it happens all the time. If you think it's cheating, then you need to change the rules to make it cheating. But until you change the rules- it's the, problem, the problem with that is how do you prove it? How do you prove that this person's only on the ballot in order to split the vote of his rival? Do you understand? But, 
But even if he was, why would that matter? Well, there's an argument that it shouldn't matter. I agree with you. But the, the, what I guess what I'm saying is that it's very easy to point fingers at Chicago. Sure. There's widespread cheating and fraud. To tell you the truth, the Democratic Party has been so ensconced there, they don't have to cheat. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure they do, to tell you the yeah. truth. Right. I, 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 you may not, uh, but before we tie up, I leave you with a story of our own, our own native politics. There were there were parts of this country where people would comment that you know, even the red, even the dead would rise to vote for Fianna Fáil or to vote for De Valera. But and there were there were places, particularly in the west and the islands, where there was still a, a certain amount of illiteracy. And if an illiterate came in and had to mark his ballot, then he would do so with the with the with the assistant assistance of of the clerk in the vote in the polling station now he would he would read the list of the, the of the candidates and the the voter would instruct him orally mm -hmm. on how on how he wished to vote but to do that then the whole station had to be cleared so he his vote would remain secret right. however because it was the country it was and the people were the people they were when having gone through this great process, laborious process of getting everybody out, the person would then roar in the loudest possible voice, number one, oh man, so nobody could doubt his loyalty to the great local chieftains, whoever they were. Mm -hmm. And I also think you think it must have been this terrible sense of, oh God, now we're going to go through this whole palaver again and everybody will stand outside and wait to listen to their voice. Listen, Seth, it, Thank you very much for your time. It's been fascinating listening to you. I hope maybe we'll get a, a chance to come back and speak to you again about other issues in the United States or even in states, things in Ireland. I want to touch I, you. I do, I do occasionally talk about Irish issues, but I try to keep it to the legal system rather than broader but politics. The legal system, and which has been of which has been of, of discussion lately. In fact, I think people discovered the name of the the, 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 the chief the, the chief justice who never knew the name of the chief justice. <laughs> before because of a game of golf which maybe that's our a little our irish thing so i'd like to thank our viewers for joining us again i'd like to invite you if you if you can to hit on the subscribe button because then you'll be uh, uh advised when new material is coming up also we're coming into the winter we've a lot of really serious campaigns we've a lot of life issues facing us that we need to work on so if you could hit the donate button anything you give will be used to promote the campaigns that we know are close to your heart and will be used efficiently. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Seth, and thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you again safe. Stay safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.